to Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, time in your house. Lord, it's time to lift you up in praise, Father. Lord, it's time to, Lord, just come to you in prayer, Father, and bring, bring our, our needs and our wants and our desires to you, Father. And Lord, we thank you for your, your answers and your, your healing touches in these. And Lord, just uh, continue to guide us throughout our lives. In your son's precious holy name, amen. Today we'll be uh, in John 3, 1 through 16. Uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version. And um, basically it's a story of the secret disciple, as he's called, Nicodemus. Um, you know, sometimes I don't wonder reading through the Bible if, if Nicodemus wasn't closer to getting it than some of the actual disciples. Um, if you read the story of the disciples as they followed Jesus, sometimes they just didn't get it. So um, we're going to go through that today, and it starts out in verse, uh, we'll start out here in verse 3. It says, Now there is a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who is a member of the Jewish ruling council, which for those of you who don't know is the group that really didn't care for Jesus much. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now, Nicodemus, is, he's, he's a little uh, shaken by this, and he says, but how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, and you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. And again, Nicodemus, he says, but how can this be? You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And then we get to John three sixteen, which is probably the first verse most of us ever learned. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus that uh, it's not the earthly things that matter. It's not the things of this world that we live in even today that matter. But it's the spiritual things that are important. Uh, last week's Bible study, we talked about, um, it was called Mirage, um, about a man wandering in the desert. And he wanders for so long in the desert that he walks right through a small puddle of water and doesn't even recognize it. And it's the same with us in the world today. We, we go along with our little blinders on, concentrating on the things of this world that we totally miss the things that are spiritual in this world. And um, it's called a mirage. A mirage, the definition is a misleading image presented to the vision. It's an optical illusion something that deceives or misleads intellectually, per perception of something objectively existing in such a way as to cause misinterpretation of its actual nature. Now, I know that gets kind of deep. Um, basically, it's uh, seeing things that aren't really there and not recognizing the things that are. Basically, it's kind of a loose interpretation of it. And um, what's going on here is that Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus how this works. 
He's trying to tell him that he, that he, Christ, is better than anything Nicodemus owns, anything he ever learned. He's trying to explain to Nicodemus that no matter how important he is, how much stuff he has, how many great things he thinks he's doing, that none of that makes any difference whatsoever. None of that means as much as Christ does. And Jesus shares with Nicodemus some of the most amazing things about the gospel. And in the process, he's telling Nicodemus and us how important it is to realize that Jesus is better than the life we have. All of our knowledge, our independence, anything we think we might have. Um, let's take a moment and uh, look at life. John 3, 1 through 8. It's where Jesus tries to explain that in order for Nicodemus to obtain and see heaven, he has to be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't get that Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. And if you understand the way that Jesus is responding to Nicodemus in this, it's pretty plain. Jesus is basically saying, um, as a spiritual leader in the community, you should know this stuff already. Is basically what he's telling Nicodemus. You should already have this down. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. Jesus is telling Nicodemus that... Um, Coming to know Christ is worth starting completely over. It's, it's about being born again. It's about things that are better than life itself. And it's worth starting a brand new life, which is what we do when we come to Christ. I, I, I did a sermon a few years ago called Day One. You come to know the Lord, and now it's day one. Because... The Bible said when you when you come to Christ and you confess your sins that the old has passed away. The old Jew is is dead to Christ. You're starting with day one. Now life is hard and we sin every day. And on the positive side, every day is day one. God gives us a second chance, third chance. Sometimes some of us needed a fourth or fifth chance. But every day is day one. So basically being born again, starting all over new. Have you ever worked a really, really long time for something and uh, when you finally you got it, you worked so hard and it finally came, you got a hold of it, and you realize it wasn't quite as awesome as you thought it was going to be? You know, was that they say that, that, that uh, fantasy is never better than reality because fantasy is a fantasy? You know, you work so hard to get something you always want and you get it and it just ain't as nice as you thought it was going to be. And that could seem kind of depressing. But it's the reality of the things of this world. Because you're working a long time for something of this world and in the end it means nothing. I worked my whole career in animal control when I, before I retired with the one goal of running my own shelter which is what you do as an animal control officer. That's your top goal is to run your own shelter. And uh, it took me a long time. And I, I, I wanted it bad for years, you know. Because I had reasons, you know. I wouldn't have to follow the stupid people and stupid ideas of the bosses I was working for because I knew more than they did. Or at least I thought I did. And... Um, if, if I had it, I could just run it the way it should be. You know, the way these people should have been doing it. And then it finally happened. I became the director of my own shelter. One that I, I personally designed the building. I'd finally made it. I, I was going to do things my way. Well, surprise, I wasn't that happy. <laughs> I don't care if you think you're at the top. There's always a top over you. And you're not always going to get to do it your way. And sometimes you come to the conclusion when you finally make it that you weren't as smart all along as you thought you were. And I wasn't happy. I would finally reached my life goal of being my own boss, of running my own facility. I just wasn't that happy. 
I was missing something. Now that I finally had everything I thought I wanted, what do you strive for then? When you think you've gotten everything you want in life, where do you go from there? What do you do from that point? Where's your purpose after that? And the problem I had there was I was chasing earthly desires and earthly wants. And I thought that if I just had all these things that I'd be happy. I'd be making the money I thought I deserve. I'd be making the decisions I thought needed to be made. I'd be happy. And the truth of the matter is, it was a big fat mirage. It wasn't real. Having everything you think you deserve or want in life, it's just not real. Again, once you get there, <clears throat> then what? You know, where do you go from up? Uh, the problem with this generation today, and, and my stepson learned this valuable lesson. He graduated from college, very intelligent man. And he couldn't find a job because, well, according to him, no, nobody, nobody understood his worth. I mean, he felt like he was supposed to start at the top and work his way up because he knew all this stuff. And he learned a lesson before I did. It doesn't work that way. You don't start at the top and work your way up. But it's through this realization that I discovered my true meaning in life. And that was Jesus Christ. That was sharing, sharing the gospel to people. The most fulfilling job I've had in life is this one that I don't even get paid for. This one is the most fulfilling job ever. Because here I can really make a difference. I, I can share the gospel with people. I can share the message that really means something. Sure, I could come in here and tell you, hey, if you tithe, God will bless you threefold. You get more and more, you'll have more stuff. But it'd be a lie. Maybe you would get more stuff. I don't know. Maybe that's true. But unless you plan on getting buried in that Ferrari you thought you deserved, it ain't going to mean nothing in the end. But when we follow Jesus, we're always striving for something better. And you're working for the kingdom of God. And uh, after retiring, I, I can trust you, working for the kingdom of God has much greater benefits than any job you'll ever work. Sure, you'll get that health care when you get sick. You go to the hospital to help pay your bills. But I'm looking at that ultimate health care, you know, the one where I can live forever. And uh, my Scott and White health plan is not covering that. It's not. I'm sorry. It's just not going to. One time there is this man who got really, really sick. And he was on his hospice deathbed at home. And he told his wife, he said, I want you to gather all my money up and put it in a big box and put it in the attic. And when I die, I'm going to collect it on the way out. I'm going to take it with me. The man died and... After his funeral, his wife came home and went upstairs and looked in the attic, and there was that big chest of money sitting up in the attic. She thought about it a minute, and she said, You know, I knew I should have put that in the basement. You can't take it with you. I told my wife one time when I die, I'm going to take all my money with me. She told me she'd write me a check and put it in a cask. It'd be easier. You can't take it with you. Why? Because none of this matters. None of the earthly things that we have here really make any difference. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be successful, and I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't have things. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying don't count on those for your happiness because it ain't going to work. I, I used to count on alcohol and drugs to make me happy. 
They didn't. I ended up more miserable than ever. What they did was they masked the hole in my heart that was missing Jesus. That's all it did. And then when I'd sober up, that hole was still there. It was covering it up. Because I was counting on things of this world to fill the hole in my heart that only Christ can. And that's the big mirage. That's the big illusion. But again, it's okay to have things. You just have to remember what's more important, earthly things or the things that are everlasting. It's all about choices. Do you uh, play golf or go to church? I uh, pass the lake, come here this morning, boats all over the lake. Do you fish or go to church? Do you sleep or do you go to church? Worse yet, do you sleep in church? Just, just saying, it's happened. It's just happened. I've heard people snore in church. Um, I like to think that they were just lifting a joyful noise, but I think it was snoring. But it comes down to what's truly important to you. I, I told this story one time. And uh, I'm going to tell it again this morning because I enjoy it. It was this beautiful, picture-perfect Sunday. The temperature was great. The sun was shining. No breeze. And uh, this preacher was in a quandary about what to do. He really wanted to play a game of golf. So instead of giving the Sunday service, he called his associate pastor. And I'm not talking about money. Um, Monty, I'm not talking about you. And he says, <coughs> I'm not feeling well. <coughs> Could you give the message? And he takes a break and he goes out to play golf. Instead of coming to the Sunday service, loads up the car. He drives three hours away to this beautiful golf course where no one had recognized him. Otherwise, he'd have to say, shouldn't you be in church too? So he starts playing this game of golf. And an angel up above is watching the preacher play, and he was a little upset. He's like, hey, God, man, this preacher's down here playing golf instead of giving the Sunday service. He should be punished for this. And God agreed. Maybe he should be punished. Preacher teed up on the first hole, and he swung, and he hit the ball perfect. 400 yards right to the green where a slight breeze gently rolled it into the cup. And as they say in basketball, it was nothing but net. I mean, it rolled right in, right? And he's just amazed and excited and jumping up for joy. And the angel looked at God and said, Sir, I thought you were going to punish him. What you do that for? God smiled and he said, I did. Just think about it a minute. Who is he ever going to tell about this? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. John 3, 9 through 15 is all about knowledge. And um, Nicodemus just doesn't understand it. And honestly, I, most of the disciples didn't get it either. I mean, Jesus talks about what's going to happen with the death and resurrection. It's mentioned like 11 times in the New Testament. And when it happens, the disciples are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it happened. I uh, don't laugh. We go through life doing the same thing. The gospel staring at us right in the face. And, and, and like the worldly, worldly mirage, we just keep walking along. It, it happens to us too. Okay, you can laugh. That was funny. But he's trying to make it clear that, that even though Nicodemus knows the law, he, he, can, he can quote like the first six books of the Bible, word for word. I do good with John 3.16. But he's trying to tell them that that's not enough. No amount of learning, studying time, sitting in church. Sitting in church honestly doesn't do you any good. None of that can make up for what Jesus gives freely. Now, somebody doesn't get mad. I'm not telling you don't come to church. I'm saying that sitting here doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't give you the gospel. I'm saying it doesn't matter what your credentials are. 
Doesn't matter if you got a title of a pastor, CEO of a company, how important you think you are. If you aren't willing to accept that Jesus is more important than any of that, more than anything the world can provide for you, like Nicodemus, you just don't understand the gospel. You've fallen for the mirage. Look, we're raised in a society that teaches us to be independent, okay? We all want our kids to grow up, to provide for themselves, to get a good job. God, just so they'll quit asking us for money, okay? Let's face it. My kids are in their 30s, and I st they still cost me money. You got kids, and you know. Any of y'all kids in your 30s know? Oh, man, dude, you definitely know. I mean, kids are expensive. They cost money. But we want them to be independent, to stand on their own. Children are raised to not need anything or want anything, to be completely independent. We're taught to, that we can't rely on anybody in this world but ourselves. You know, uh, there's a line from a Prince song that says, In this world, you're on your own. Prince is wrong, by the way. John 3.16 says that Jesus can save us from sin and eternal punishment. We just have to believe him. We have to depend on him. We have to set aside this supposed independence that we feel like we need for ourselves and know we need to rely on him. It's important to have friends and loved ones. It's important to have other people in your life support you. People die. People make mistakes. But there's this one guy that'll never die and doesn't make mistakes, and you can always count on him. Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So we have to be dependent on someone other than ourselves. We have to be open. We have to be open to what, what Christ wants for us and open to see what he wants for us so we can take our eyes off the mirage of this world and look to what's important, look to what's real. Like I talked about the man walking through the desert to walk right past the puddle of water. Imagine dying of thirst because you didn't even recognize a puddle of water. There are people that are dying every single day in this world without the gospel. And it's been there in front of them the entire time, but they were too blind and too focused on what doesn't matter to see it. We can't do this by ourselves. We need Jesus. I, I think of all the famous singers, movie stars. I, I was watching a video of the other day of Robin Williams. And who, who committed suicide from depression? These people are rich. Some of them have planes they don't want for anything they've got fame they got popularity they got money they got everything a human being thinks they could ever want but they were missing a relationship with jesus christ the one thing that mattered nothing in this world means a hill of beans without a spiritual purpose nothing everything in this world is just a mirage Everything in this world has no substance without Christ. Everything we have, everything we do is meaningless without Christ. Your car, your new car. I love Don's new car. Don got himself a new car. That's a ministry tool. That can open up a conversation with somebody. Your new motorcycle could open up a conversation with somebody. Everything you have in life can open up a conversation with someone about Christ. I was born with disabilities. This disability allowed me to open up a conversation with a homeless man for Christ, a man that everyone in our group told us won't talk to anybody, won't listen to anybody, hates the world, and doesn't care. I had one thing in common that so few people have, and that was an opening to share Christ with them. We go the next month to minister to the homeless. This man comes and finds me. 
You have the opening you need to share the gospel with someone. You just need God to help you recognize it. Again, it's okay to be successful. It's okay to have money. It's okay to, to tithe because we got air conditioning in here. It's okay to have air conditioning at home. It's okay to work for those things. Just understand where everything you have comes from. It's all a gift from God. If, if you're successful, if you win the lottery, congratulations. I'll be happy for you. Don't forget to tithe. But use it with a purpose. Use anything God gives you with a purpose. I don't care if you got $5. Use it with a purpose. Don't care if you have a million dollars. Use it with a purpose. Otherwise, you're just living the mirage. You're just living a fake, worthless life that has no prize in the end. Like atheists. I can't imagine living a life without hope thinking, well, I'm just going to die someday and be dirt. What kind of sad existence is that without hope? Without hope for something better. But people choose to live that mirage. People choose to live that life. Don't let them die without someone, you, telling them there's something better. If you share the gospel because that's what Christ wants you to do and they choose not to accept it, you can't blame yourself for that. What you can do is blame yourself if you don't tell somebody because that's what God wants you to do. Why would you have the greatest gift that anyone could ever have and not want to tell someone about it? So if you're living the mirage, stop and turn to Christ. UMHB, the college, Baptist College in Belton, has a new slogan. I saw it on their sign the other day. They're getting ready for that coming year. It says, live life with purpose. Live life with purpose. A lot of people live life accidentally. They do. Live life with purpose. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you allow us to see the Amazing, precious gift you want us to have, Lord. Lord, help us recognize what, what Nicodemus couldn't recognize, Father. Lord, that we can have all things through you who gives us strength, Lord. Lord, the only thing that matters in this world, Father, is you. And the amazing gift of eternal life that you offer, Father. Lord, we thank you for the gifts we have in this life for the money for the blessings for the ability to live life father lord i just ask that you you remind us to not be selfish and understand that these things are gifts from you and we should give you the glory for them father and lord just give us the strength to live for you and not for the earthly things that are passing away father just guide us and direct us through our week lord and bring us back here in your time and Lord, just give us the strength to tell someone about you. In your son's precious holy name, amen.